Happy Easter. It's good to be in the house of the Lord, and it's especially good to be here on Easter Sunday morning. Amen? Amen. Just think to myself, is I love the fact that Easter Sunday happens to land on April Fool's Day this year. I think there was a lot of laughing in hell on Good Friday. I think all the demons and their angels thought, finally, we put to silence this one who came and spoke and pointed people to God. They thought they won, but it was only Friday. Amen. Sunday's coming. And Jesus, we thank God, rose from the dead, making a public spectacle of the enemy. And now we who have embraced him, amen. We who have embraced him will be raised together with him in newness of life. And so we celebrate Easter uh, this morning. We, uh, we're beginning a new sermon series. We're calling it The Hunt. And we had this idea when um, we kind of came up with the idea we were going to head on over to Rosemont over in uh, our, our neighbors around the corner. We, did a, we had a great time yesterday doing our Easter egg hunt and having an opportunity just to get to know our, our, our neighbors over here and just sharing the love of Christ and the community uh, that we enjoy here at the church. And then um, we decided we're going we're gonna to kind of springboard off of that and go into this series called The the hunt. I don't know about you, but I, I used to love scavenger hunts when I was a kid. Did you, did you like, uh, I just love kind of going on a, on a hunt looking for something. I don't care if it was something of value or a Tootsie Roll. I, I just was like, I just got to win by finding that thing, right? It just, there's just something very exciting about being on a hunt. And as, uh, as we consider Easter this morning, I, I want to talk to you about a hunt that, that all of humanity is engaged in. In fact, if we're honest with ourselves, we admit that whether, whether consciously or not, we'd admit that we're all, we're all hunting for something. We're all looking for, for something. Over the course of the next four weeks, we're, we're going to be looking at four areas uh, that people tend to go on a hunt. Uh, next week, we'll be looking at the hunt for a clean slate. I mean, you know, people want a do-over sometimes in life. Right? And sometimes life doesn't give you a, a do-over, but how many know Jesus does? Right? And so we're going to look at the, the hunt for a clean slate. And then we're going to look at the hunt for validation. How many know that people are always trying to be validated by things? They're always trying to present themselves in a way that will be accepted, or acceptable to other people. Um, and validation really isn't something that can start on the outside. It's got to start on the inside um, and, and when we're in connection with the God who created us. And so we're going to look at the hunt for validation, and then we're going to look at the, the hunt for freedom. Can I really be free from other people's expectations? Does anybody have expectations of you? Yeah, that can be really, that, that can really bring you into some bondage, right? And so we're going to be looking at the hunt for, uh, for freedom. But today's Easter, if you had, and I know that because you're all so dressed up, Services have been full. It's good. But it's Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday. It's the, it's the benchmark of the Christian faith. Right, it's the Super Bowl. It's the World Series. It's the Stanley Cup. It's the, it's the most significant day on the, on the Christian calendar because without the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we just have a really good teacher who lived 2,000 years ago. Without the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we just have somebody who put in motion and modeled for us love and service and, and humility. Without the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we just have a, a, an incredible rabbi who did some amazing miracles. But all throughout his ministry, especially towards the end, he talked about his resurrection. And without the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we didn't have the final amen, the ultimate validation of his ministry. Nothing to substantiate that he was more than a prophet. He was more than a rabbi. He was more than a teacher. He was very God of very God. And he substantiated that by, by rising from the dead. There were a lot of people who claimed to be God. There was a lot of good teachers who claimed to be God. But their bones are still in the graves, but not Jesus. He is the only one that backed up what he said by showing he was more powerful than even death itself. And he rose from the dead. Jesus is not any more risen today than he was three weeks ago. 
but we come together as the body of Christ and we, we recognize the awesome truth of the resurrection and we, we celebrate that this morning. All of Christianity hinges on the fact of the resurrection. And so this morning I want to talk to you about the hunt for something to believe in. The hunt for something to believe in. You know, every person alive has, a, has a devo- a, some kind of a, a default setting on the inside, a, a desire for something to believe in that's bigger than them, something that's more powerful than them, something that has all of the answers to life's questions. And that's why people get caught up in all kinds of idolatry. You know, they're all looking and they're all searching for something that is, that is bigger than them. In short, all of creation is on a hunt for their creator. This disconnect becomes a reality. Now, people don't tend to word it that way, of course, but they're all searching for something to fill that God-shaped hole in their heart that only God can fill. And you know, we live in a time and in a day where we have so much access to things, don't we? We have so much access to to stuff and people tend to want to fill that void in their life with all kinds of things only to find that that really nothing is going to satisfy. Nothing can fill that God-shaped hole like God himself can. Sometimes people try and fill that hole with things like religion. I mean, it appears, it appears to make sense, right? I mean, however, religion doesn't satisfy. Now, maybe you're in church today, you think, and I can't believe you just said that. That's why we're, we're here today. I want to tell you this morning that religion doesn't satisfy. Because Jesus never came to establish a religion. Jesus didn't create a, a religious system for us to hold on to. What Jesus did is he created a relationship for us to enjoy, creation and creator walking in unity together. Religion can never save a person. Religion is, religion is man's way of trying to get to God. Whether it be through their good works, whether it be through their, their church attendance, whether it be through their, their generosity or, or any good things they can do, religion is man's attempt to get to God. And it doesn't work. It never has worked. If it could work, Jesus would have never had to come. But God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And so Jesus didn't come and and bring us religion. Jesus came and brought us redemption. Redemption is only experienced through personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And so there there are some really good people that are looking to fill that void with religion. They have tried God. And what they mean by that is they went to church or they cracked the Bible or they said a prayer or they talked to somebody, but they didn't connect with, with God. There was a religious leader in the Bible by the name of Nicodemus, and Nicodemus was, was on a hunt for something to believe in. And he had a religion. I mean, he was, he was a Pharisee. I mean, these guys were like, you know, we think of Pharisees today and we think, you know, the word Pharisaical, they're, they're false. But a Pharisee in Jesus' day, they were respected people. They, they followed the word of God, the law of God. They, they sought very hard to please God through their religious efforts. And, re, and, and Nicodemus had, had found religion, but it wasn't satisfying. And so he went on a hunt. He went looking for something more because he knew that what he had wasn't enough. John chapter 3, we see, we read that there was a man in the, of the Pharisees named Nicodemus. He was, a, he was a ruler of the Jews. And this man came to Jesus by night. Why? He didn't want anybody to see that he didn't have the answer. He didn't want anybody to see that he was talking to Jesus. And so he comes under the cover of night because he had questions that he knew only Jesus could answer. This man came to Jesus by night and said, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. And Jesus answered and said, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Did you, did you hear a question come off of Nicodemus' lips? I love that. 
Nicodemus, first he just comes and he validates who Jesus is. We know that you come from God. Nobody can do what you, you, what you do. And Jesus doesn't listen to the words that come out of Nicodemus' mouth. Jesus sees what's coming out of Nicodemus' heart. Nicodemus had a question. Nicodemus was on a hunt. Nicodemus was looking for something that his religion couldn't provide. And so Jesus answers the real question that Nicodemus was having. Nicodemus, truly, I say to you, unless, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus, I, I know what you're really curious about is how do you get to the other side? Your real question is how do you come into relationship with the God who created you? And so I'm going to ignore your first question or your lack thereof, and I'm going to answer the real question. Nicodemus, you must be born again. Nicodemus answered in a very logical way. How can a man be born again when he's old? Can he go back inside his mother's womb and, and be born again? And Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water, that's your natural birth, and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. You need to be both born naturally, and then you need to be born spiritually. And unless those two things happen, Nicodemus, you cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh, natural, and that is flesh. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I say to you, Nicodemus, you must be born again. Well, Jesus wasn't presenting to Nicodemus a religious system. He wasn't presenting Nicodemus a belief system. What Jesus was presenting to Nicodemus was an experience. How many of you have, asked, have been asked the question, are you one of those born-again Christians? I, I hate that question. I always say, well, it depends on what you mean by that, <laughs> right? Because there's a lot of people who claim to be born-again Christians that I do not want to be identified with, right? And so the title, the label of, of born-again, it's not a label that Jesus was talking about. It was an experience. In the same way that we are born physically, we must be born spiritually as well. Nicodemus was on a hunt that night because he knew that his pursuit of religion was not going to satisfy that deep need within him that only God could fill. And so he came to Jesus by night. Can I tell you that there are so many people, good meaning, well-intended, good moral people who try so hard to get closer to God. I was looking at some articles about what people have been doing around the world on Good Friday, just literally nail, having themselves nailed to the cross, trying to be identified with Christ's death. And I think to myself, are you kidding me? He went to the cross so you don't have to. He went to the cross so you don't have to work so hard at saving yourself because you couldn't possibly do it. Well-meaning, well-intended people. They're hunting for something to fill that void, that God-shaped hole in their heart that only God can fill. And their hunt is an exercise in futility until they find Jesus. Nicodemus, his hunt for religion was empty and unfulfilling, and so he went on a hunt for Jesus. There are other people who are on a hunt in the scriptures. I, I think of people like Zacchaeus. I think of Zacchaeus. We're introduced to Zacchaeus in Luke chapter 19. He was a chief tax collector. Now, to you and me, that doesn't really mean much in, in 2018, but to be a chief tax collector in Jesus' day meant, man, you were wealthy. It meant that you had some really good political influence. You were a very powerful person, a very influential person. And so to be a chief tax collector in Jesus' day would suggest that you are the, at, at the epitome of success. Everybody knew you. You had anything you wanted. And so we have this picture of, of Zacchaeus. He's a, a chief tax collector. And he had heard word that Jesus was coming to town. And so we see in Luke chapter 19, he, Zacchaeus enters into Jerusalem. Oh, Jesus was entering in Jerusalem while passing through. And behold, it says there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. And he was seeking to see who Jesus was, but 
on account of the crowd, he could not, because he was a small, he was small in stature. All the short people say amen. All right, see, so we're in the Bible, right? We're, we're there. And so here is Zacchaeus, right? He, he couldn't see Jesus because of the crowd. And so he ran on ahead and he climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him. For Jesus was about to pass that way. Isn't that cool? I mean, I love, you've got this dignified, powerful, wealthy, influential chief tax collector climbing a tree. I mean, the only person I can think that would do that would be like Kenny Riker, right? I mean, Kenny, like, Kenny be climbing trees. I mean, that's just what, like, he just does that kind of, But I mean, here's, right, I mean, here's Zacchaeus, and, and he just wants to see Jesus, and, and he can't because he's so short. And so, sorry, Ken, I don't know where you are, but that landed pretty well. It was worth it. I might do it again next service. Um, <laughs> but he climbs a tree so that he can see Jesus because he realized something. Everything he had wasn't enough. Maybe, maybe this man from Galilee, maybe Jesus, maybe Jesus can fill that hole. And so he ran ahead and he climbed into a sycamore tree to see him for he was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and he said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry, come on down for I must stay at your house. I love that. I must stay at your house. And so he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. And when they, that's the religious crowd, when they saw it, they all grumbled, he has gone in to be the guest of a man who's a sinner? How dare he? Don't religious people just drive you crazy? I mean, if, 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 if it was okay enough for Jesus to go to the house, who am I? And so Jesus goes to the house and Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods, and he was a wealthy man, half of what I have I'll give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I, I will restore it fourfold. I'll give back four times as much as I took. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he's also a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. I love this story because what I love about this is at no point do you see Jesus telling Zacchaeus how to clean up his act. Can I tell you the church just gets in the way of what God is doing in people's lives sometimes? I think the church gets really good at telling everybody you need to do this and you drop the ball here and you defrauded that person and you need to give that person half your goods. And like no place did Jesus say, Zacchaeus, here's all the things you need to do to clean up your act. Jesus doesn't do that. Unfortunately, the church tends to do that sometimes. I think that if we would just let God be God and let the Holy Spirit continue the work in people's lives, he does a far greater job at making disciples than we ever could. And so instead of just telling everybody how to clean up their act, maybe what we should do is just point them to Jesus and let the Holy Spirit do what the Holy Spirit does. Because the first thing that Zacchaeus does when he comes into contact with Jesus is he realizes there's some things in his life that needs to change. And you know what? When they come to that conclusion on their own, boy, is it a whole lot more fruitful and a whole lot more life-changing. I think we can learn a lot on how Jesus dealt with sinners such as I, right? And so we see this incredible story unfold before us, but it's interesting how Zacchaeus, right? Immediately, he's willing to give up that which he had searched after for so long and gives it up because he found something, somebody so much greater in the person of Jesus Christ. In addition to these two, there were, there were thousands that followed after Jesus. Everywhere we see, as we look in the scriptures, everywhere Jesus went, the crowd showed up. People would gather in droves. Why? Because people are on the hunt for something to believe in. Something to believe in. Zacchaeus tried to fill that hole with wealth and power and political influence and everything else. But when he came to Jesus, he realized those were like square pegs in a round hole. They'll never fit. Only Jesus can fill that hole. And when, he, when Jesus filled that hole, he realized how insignificant those other things were. And he said, I'm just going to give it away. Zacchaeus and 
and Nicodemus, crowds of people. We looked at last week on Palm Sunday. History tells us two million people were there as Jesus entered into the streets of Jerusalem and they gathered and they cried out, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Finally, they have their own guy in a place of influence. Jesus is going to take over, establish himself as king. He'll be our guy. And the crowds were, were, were just overly enthusiastic and declaring that they'd lay down their very life for the cause of Jesus. Finally, we have somebody to believe in. Finally, we have someone who will set us up for success. But you see, they were believing in an outcome, not a person. They were believing in what they wanted, not what they needed. And so when it became clear that Jesus wasn't going to set up his kingdom on earth, they were, they were disappointed, right? They were, they were disillusioned. They were, they were angry. And this crowd that days earlier that cried out, Hosanna in the highest, turned on him and cried out, crucify him on Good Friday. We thought we had somebody to believe in. We thought we had our guy. He's not it. Crucify him. And they took him. And they betrayed him. And they beat him. And they hung him on a cross until he died. And they placed him in a tomb. All of their hopes lost. Their dreams shattered. They were blown away. They wanted so bad for someone to believe in. But there was a theme, there was a, 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 a conversation that Jesus had oftentimes with his disciples and those who were listening in. And he had said it many times. That they heard him, but they, they didn't really hear him. Don't we do that? I heard everything you said, but what did you say? And Jesus oftentimes, especially as he was, he was nearing the end of his ministry, he made many references to what was ahead and what was going to, what was going to happen, that he was going to be handed over and, and, and delivered to, to be executed and, and that he would die. But in three days, he would, he'd rise again. He'd say things like in John chapter 2, he'd say, destroy this temple. And in three days, I'll, rise, I'll raise it up again. It says the Jews said, well, it's taken us 46 years to build the temple. How are you going to raise it up in three days? But Jesus was speaking about the temple of his body. When therefore he was raised from the dead, when it finally happened, his disciples, ah, now I remember what he was talking about, that he said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. That's what he meant. Jesus said in, John, in Matthew chapter 12, just as Jonah was, in, was three days and nights in the belly of the fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. We hear you, we just don't hear you. Matthew 16, from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and on the third day, be raised to life. He had said it. He had been clear. They just did not hear it. Speaking of himself in John chapter 10, I love he says, no one, no one takes my life from me. I lay it down of myself. I have the power to lay it down, and I've got the power to raise it up again. Nobody takes my life from me. And it's Jesus speaking about his power over death. I mean, he had showed that he had power over blindness and paralysis and, and deafness and, 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 and other people's death. And he had power like nobody had ever seen. But he also said, I have power over death itself. And in three days after my death, I'll rise again. You see, the entire credibility of Jesus' ministry was connected to his resurrection. 
That's why the resurrection is the benchmark, uh, the, the defining moment, the, the final amen of Jesus' ministry. And so on Friday, when they, when they placed him in the tomb, they were placing more than the one that they loved in the tomb. They were placing all of their hopes, all of their dreams, everything that they believed was going to become their reality, died that day and was placed in the tomb. In fact, they were so disillusioned by the, the death of Jesus that they, they failed to connect the many statements that, that Jesus made concerning his death and resurrection. Friday was very dark. Saturday was very sad. But Sunday was coming. And as the sun began to rise, so did their hope. Matthew chapter 28, it says, And after the Sabbath, toward the, the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake. For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and, and rolled back the stone and, and sat on it. His appearance, speaking of the angel, his appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. Could you imagine what that must have been like? Here are the guards right there. They're guarding the tomb. All of a sudden there's an earthquake and this, the only thing that changes is the stone is rolled out of the way and they look up and they see this angel sitting on top of it. And they cowered like dead men. I'm sure they did. But the angel said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you're on a hunt for Jesus. I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. I gotta be honest with you, Resurrection Sunday has never meant so much to me than it has these last, this, 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 this Easter. As I think about my dad and the idea of, 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 man, his faith became sight. That, man, what we celebrated since I was a little boy about the resurrection of Jesus and the hope that we'd have in Jesus, his faith has become sight. And man, it just becomes so real, doesn't it? I mean, these ladies, man, they were on a hunt. They had seen what had happened. And they were on a hunt for Jesus. It says in verse 1 that they went to go see the tomb, but I like what the angel says. You didn't come looking for the tomb. You came looking for, it says in verse 5, you came looking for Jesus. You came looking for Jesus. And I love what happens here. It says, and this, there was a great earthquake, right? And the stone was rolled away. Could you imagine? Listen, we got to remember, the stone wasn't rolled away so Jesus, Jesus can get out. I mean, this is the same Jesus who walked through walls. This is the same Jesus who created everything. I mean, certainly, it, it, there's no stone that could possibly contain him. The stone was rolled away, not so Jesus can come out, but so that they could go in. And they can walk in and says, come and take a look and see where he used to be. You have something, ladies, to believe in. He who was dead is alive again. Come and see where he lay. They didn't come to see someone who was dead, but someone who was alive, had risen from the dead. And you know what, what God did then? He still does today. He still moves stones. He still moves those obstacles that get in our way from seeing Jesus. He still is in the, in, in the, in the, in the revelation business, if you will. He is still opening our eyes to see Jesus. How many have been on the receiving end of seeing Jesus? Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, is about God fulfilling his promise to meet all of the needs of man not by way of religion like, like, like Nicodemus sought. Not by wealth or influence or power, but by rising from the dead and substantiating all that he said 
and removing any stones that might block us from, from seeing him. How about you this Easter Sunday? What are you on the hunt for? Is it relationships? Is it wealth? Power? Influence? Those things will never satisfy. They are a mirage that you just keep chasing after, hoping, you're hoping that it'll fill that void. How much more does the richest man want? Just a little more. It's, it's a mirage. There's just never satisfaction in anything other than Jesus. And here's the beautiful thing. As I said before, man is on a hunt. But man isn't the only one on a hunt. We see that Jesus is on the hunt, ultimately. That's what he told Zacchaeus. The Son of Man, Zacchaeus, has come to seek and save that which was lost. Zacchaeus, you thought you came looking for me, but Zacchaeus, I came looking for you. Zacchaeus, I came to see you today. You didn't initiate this, Zacchaeus. You didn't start this process. This wasn't your hunt. This is my hunt. This son of man came to seek and save that which is lost. Listen, I'm going to tell you, I didn't find Jesus. Newsflash, Jesus was never lost. Not once. I didn't find him. He found me. I was lost and and the way he found me was through the, the dissatisfaction of all the things that I, I try to fill that void with in my life. And you see, I try to fill all those voids, and when I realized that, that nothing can satisfy, and I looked for something else, he who had searched me down, the hound of heaven, came and found me. I was lost, and now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see his amazing grace. How sweet the sound. And so ironically, the, the hunter became the hunted. Jesus says, nobody comes to me unless the Father draws him. He said, you didn't choose me, but I chose you. And he chooses us in such a way that he allows us to feel like we chose him. He allows us to become dissatisfied with those things that we think we need only so that we can embrace the one who is pursuing us all along. The resurrection of Jesus gives us not only something to believe in, but someone. Someone who will never disappoint. Someone who is the only one who is able to fill that void that we try so hard to fill with so many other things. Hey, it's okay to have other things. It's okay to have other things. But when we put our value, when we put our hope in things, we're going to be left disappointed. There is only one. Nicodemus came to that realization. Zacchaeus came to that realization. The crowds came to that realization. Many of us this morning have come to that realization that there is only one who brings true satisfaction and his name is Jesus. And he backed up everything he said by being victorious over death, hell, and the grave. And he set us up as we embrace him to find our place in God's story, to find our purpose for being. For it's in that that true fulfillment is found. Let's pray. Let's pray. Maybe you're here this morning and you feel like you've been on a hunt. Maybe you've been looking for fulfillment. Maybe you didn't even realize it. So many of us do that. Searching for something we don't even realize we're searching. We're bouncing from 
purchase to purchase to purchase to promotion to promotion to motion to promotion to relationship from relationship to relationship, trying so hard and feeling so unsettled. I want you to know this morning that only Jesus is capable of filling that void. And if you're here this morning, I want to encourage you to ask Christ, the one who walked the earth, who went to the cross, who went to the tomb, and then rose again for us, to ask Jesus to come into your life, to be your Lord and your Savior. Because in that, and in that only, true fulfillment, not only in this earth, but in life to come, is found. And if you're here this morning and you say, I, I want to give my life to Christ. I've never done that before. I've never, I never realized I had to do that. I didn't realize I was searching. I wondered what got me here this morning. I, I want you to know this message was for you. And so I want to pray a prayer this morning. As I said the other day, there, there, there's, no, there's nothing magical about a prayer, but you know what? When we mean what we say, and we recognize we are talking to God with our heart, I want you to know that God hears your prayer and he responds to your prayer. And so I'm gonna pray a prayer this morning and if, if you'd like to, I'm gonna ask everybody to pray with me, and, but if there are some here that you've never prayed that prayer before, I wanna ask you to pray that with all of your heart, recognizing you're talking to God. And I believe that you, like Nicodemus and like so many of us, will not only, you will experience that born again experience that God desires and requires for each and every person to experience. Pray with me. Dear Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God. I believe you came to the earth were born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, and paid the price for the sins of the world on the cross. I am a sinner. I ask that you forgive me of all my sin to come into my heart, be my Lord, and my Savior, this day I put all my trust in what you did for me. Come into my life, be my Lord and Savior, in Jesus' name, amen. Father, I pray for every person in this place that prayed this prayer, especially for the very first time. I thank you for your word that reminds us that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. I thank you, Lord, that there are those that might have walked in here spiritually dead, but walk out spiritually alive, not because they've come to church, but because they've embraced Jesus. And Father, I pray this morning that you would just continue to just encourage and fan that flame of life in the hearts of each and every person in this place. Lord, may every one of us walk out in the resurrection power of Jesus Christ, knowing, that, knowing in whom we have believed and live lives that are pleasing to you. Lord, we thank you for this time. We, we commit it all into your hands. Be glorified, we pray in Christ's name. Amen, amen. Hey, if you prayed that prayer for the first time, I'd love to hear from you. Um, I'd love to help you get on your journey um, towards uh, growing in your walk with Jesus. And so uh, there's going to be some folks up front here after service that uh, they'd love to pray with you and won't keep you long, I promise, but just want to make, make some connections. Those of you who are on our, our altar team, our prayer team, please make your way up afterwards. And, and uh, we just want to celebrate um, with you what God is doing. Amen? Let's stand together.